Today, in this world, people don't have, for the most part, a main source where they gain their wisdom. Where they say, this is where I get my way of determining right and wrong. This source is where I get my way of determining how I should guide my life. And so that's the objective of these videos and also that you might have a spiritual revelation that Jesus Christ will change your life and transform your heart and open your eyes to see the things of the Word of God and how this world is commanded by Christ Jesus and how this world was designed for His glory and not for the glory of man. And we're going to begin in Judges 6, 1. This is in the ancient days. This is recounting a various story with the children of Israel. I'm going to go ahead and just read the text. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. The Lord gave them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian overpowered Israel. And because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves the dens that are in the mountains, and the caves, and the strongholds. For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. They would encamp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza, and leave no sustenance in Israel and no sheep or ox or donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents. They would come up like locusts in number. Both they and their camels would not, uh, could not be counted, so that they laid waste the land as they came in. And Israel was brought very low because of Midian. And the people of Israel cried out for help to the Lord. And here we see a recurring pattern that always happens time and time again. The children of Israel did evil and they fell into oppression. But this pattern is not limited to the children of Israel or even to the Jews today, but it's for all nations. That in any nation that commits evil, any nation that despises the way of God and despises the way of, of good and being loving to their neighbor and being a virtuous and, and strong people, that when they fall into sin and when they fall into wickedness and self-serving and self-satisfaction and self-gratification and self-pursuit and when they put all sense of of righteousness and peace to the wind they fall into evil and they fall into oppression and we can look through various civilizations and various peoples throughout history and find that if it that from them being evil from their wicked ways they always were conquered by another nation or they fell from within one of the two or perhaps the Lord set them to destruction by a volcano or by a natural disaster. But whether it's an impending army or falling from within or a horrendous natural disaster, they fell. They fell because their moral values were gone and God no longer blessed them as he did in their beginning. And this is what's happened here to Israel. And at this point, it says in chapter 6, verse 7, When the people of Israel cried out to the Lord on account of the Midianites, the Lord sent a prophet to the people of Israel. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, 
I led you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of slavery. And I, I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the God of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. And here we want to look at one key aspect. God had brought Israel out of Egypt by this time. By the man Moses, who God had established as a prophet for Israel. God had pulled Israel out of oppression. God had pulled Israel out of slavery. Out of the heavy taskmasters who had oppressed Israel for so long. For a series of hundreds of years. God brings them out by a series of miracles. Really, judgments that were cast on Egypt. That finally convinced that hard-hearted Pharaoh to let go of God's people. And though they had traveled through the wilderness for some time, for 40 years, the Lord God brought them into the promised land with Joshua and brought them into peace. And so therefore God had brought them out of Egypt and out of slavery into peace and prosperity and into their own land. And when we read in those passages following that time, God made a declaration to Israel saying that they had a choice to either do good and, and live in the land or fall away into evil and therefore be subject to disaster and, and travesty and oppression and all forms of war and famine and disease and all of the treacherous judgments of God. If they did good, they would live in peace. If they did evil, they would live in chaos. And God says here, I led you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of slavery. And I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You should not fear the, the God of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. Israel always serves some God. People will always serve some God. It'll either be the true God, or it'll be a God that, that's made up by other men to control you. People will always serve something or someone. The question is, is the something or someone that they serve good, or is it evil? Is it the true God, or is it illusions? He said to you, in, in verse 10, and he says, And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. He's making this declaration to them because he wants to bring them out of their false thinking. Their false thinking got them into this slavery via Midian. And the Midianites, because they did evil in the, in the sight of the Lord. And when people do evil, they serve other gods. And though we don't have the same wooden idols and, and idols of gold and silver that were evident in the ancient days, Baal and all of these various gods that were made up by men, Men in our world still serve false gods that may not be idols, but the things that they serve promise to give them 
the very things that the idols of the ancient days promised to give those who serve them. Men of today, they, they serve uh, various motivational speakers who tell them that they can get great prosperity and great wealth if they follow their program. And people are seeking to get this sense of fame and glory and esteem and money and their whole lives are, are built on creating their own self-image and their own self-perception. And we hear all this talk about positive thinking in books like The Secret and this arising of the New Age movement again. It's not really New Age, it's just repackaged. That promise all sorts of things. And even in the realm of Christianity, the focus has been pushed off of the redeeming power of the Lord Jesus Christ and has been guided now towards manifestations of miracles, which I'm not saying that miracles aren't able to be performed by God and, through, and by His people, but the emphasis of the miracle is to glorify God, not to glorify people or to make this this great ad, much ado about miracles and people serve all sorts of various systems and programs and all these books and they're always learning trying to get to this this moment this very hard um, hard to achieve moment where they can have what they want. They work so hard to get there and it's all about them. It's all about them. And so they do evil in the world. Because when they begin to forget about God, they begin to do whatever they feel like. And they have no more basis for good and evil, or basis for right or wrong. And even the premises of logic began to break down. And hence we can find civilizations in, for example, just various tribes in South America and Africa, for instance, where the people are barbarians. They have lost all sense of logic and morality, and even their humanity is gone. How did this happen? How did these people become like this? They lived in the flesh, they lived for themselves, generation after generation followed, and they began to live in wickedness, and they forgot about God, and they forgot about why they exist. They lost their humanity. And so here God says to the children of Israel, I said to you, I am the Lord your God. He's trying to call them back to reality. He's trying to call them back to freedom. In verse 11, Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at Ophra, which belonged to Joash the Abzerite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. Here we have a, a clue that tells us that if Gideon is treading out wheat in or beating out wheat in the wine press and not putting it on its threshing floor where it should have been threshed, he is he's hiding it from the Midianites. This is a clue to tell us that their oppression was great. And indeed, they scarfed up every little last bit of food and produce that the children of Israel produced. In verse 12, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him, appeared to Gideon, and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, Please, sir, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us, and where are all the his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? 
But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of, of Midian. In this time we find that, that Gideon was in a period where the miracles of God weren't really being manifest in a, um, in a popular medium. There may have been miracles, but they were scarce. And they weren't miracles to the effect of liberating an entire people. Where are your wondrous deeds? He says to the angel of the Lord. Where are the miracles? He says in the next verse, The Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. Think about the, the type of mentality that, that Gideon must have had for him to come to this conclusion. The Lord has forsaken us. God is not with us any longer. Midian, uh, Gideon is upset. Gideon wants to see these miracles again. Gideon wants to have a freedom from the oppression. Gideon is not satisfied with being oppressed. It says, The Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go. Go. In this might of yours. And save Israel from the hand of Midian. You look at this and you go, How in the world can this kid, we, we find out, he says, uh, I go on in verse 15. Says, and he said to them, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. He's, he's the least in, of his clan. He's the least of his family. He, he doesn't seem to be the source of heroism. Heroism. He doesn't seem to be the source of making an impact of liberating his people. But we do find that he's displeased with oppression and that the angel of the Lord has come to him. God's going to work a, a miracle for, through someone small and insignificant. And God's going to work a miracle through someone who can only, in the end, give glory to him because he was so small to begin with that no one will come to the conclusion that it was of his own power to achieve this miracle. This is a tough time. This is a challenging time. These people had been so oppressed in every little produce that they came up with, all of their livestock. It says in verse 4, the, the, the Midianites would encamp against them, the Amalekites as well, and devour the produce. And leave no substance, no sheep or doc, donkey or ox. And they would come up with their livestock and their tents. And they would come like locusts in number. These people kept grabbing and grabbing and grabbing all of their wealth. Making the children of Israel more poor to the point that they were oppressed. And they had no more means of survival. That they were indeed slaves. Perhaps the Midianites and, and the Amalekites laughed at them and scoffed at them. And treated them like trash. They were slaves. They were nobodies. They were simply there to provide for their masters. And I bet for the majority of people, they had come to the conclusion that they were slaves. That the Amalekites and the, Gideon and, and the Midianites had told them that you are slaves. That they had convince them that their wealth and that their efforts were to be designated to reward their oppressors. That their oppressors were somehow wiser and better than them. 
any time that there are a group of people who are enslaved to another group, the oppressors who enslave the slaves must convince the slaves that they're slaves and that they're worthless. The oppressors must keep people down and must limit their humanity and must break down their humanity so that they do not have any problem with an uprising. They want to build a system. It's always been that way that oppressors who enslave slaves build a system to keep their slaves enslaved. So the majority of people, more often than not, just give up. Just forget that they are free human beings before God. And so, here we have a man who is the least of his clan, the least of his family, who is upset about the oppression who desires, he wants something to happen. He wants a miracle to free his people. Day in and day out, they're enslaved, they're enslaved, they're enslaved. We want freedom. We want liberation from our slavery. And he's angry about that. And here the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, almighty man of power. And a few verses later, the angel of the Lord says, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do, do not I send you. He's been chosen. He's been selected for a miracle. Gideon says, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, But I will be with you. And you shall strike the Midianites as one man. I will be with you. God, when he tells a man, when he chooses a man for a miraculous liberation to free his people from oppression, the, 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 the consolation that he gives him is, I will be with you. That's the consolation that helps us as believers in God to overcome the doubts and fears and cynicism and criticism and all sorts of pain and suffering in the world. We hear that word through all of the chaos and all the noise as though it comes to our mind through some divine medium that the Lord says to you, I will be with you. We will break free of that oppression. Where are all the wondrous deeds, Gideon says. The Lord is saying to Gideon, now a wondrous deed is coming. Now a miracle is coming. Now the walls of Jericho are coming down of oppression that Midian has cast on Israel. And Gideon says to him, if I now have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that it is you who speak with me. Please do, do not depart from here until I come to you and bring out my present and set it before you. And he said, I will stay till you return. The Lord is patient. And so Gideon went into his house and he prepared a young goat and unleavened cakes from an ephah of flour. The meat he put in a basket and the broth he put into a pot and brought it then to him under the terebinth and presented them. And the angel of God said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened cakes and put them on this rock and pour the broth over them. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord reached out the tip of the staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened cakes. And fire sprang up from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened cakes. And the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. So Gideon had put the, the meat and unleavened cakes before the Lord, and the Lord pushed forth his staff, 
and touch the, the meat and the unleavened cakes and fire sprang up from the rock and it consumed the meat and the unleavened cakes before Gideon's very eyes. And the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. Then Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. And Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace be to you. Do not fear. You shall not die. Do not fear. You shall not die. There's a great fear in death. And God is, uh, God is comforting Gideon and telling him that he will not die. And here we find a hint of God's promise in the Lord Jesus Christ that when he died and raised again and his blood covers the sins of humanity, that whosoever believes in Lord Jesus Christ is gifted eternal life. And so this line is meant to be a, a hint of this time. As many things in the Old Testament hint at Christ. Or hint at the thinking that we're to have in Christ. Do not fear, you shall not die. You shall not die. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, The Lord is Peace. When a person is consoled with eternal life, when a person is consoled with the fact that God is with them, as Gideon here begins to realize in his journey, in this period of his life, the conclusion that we come to is the Lord is peace. He called it the Lord is peace. To this day it still stands at opera, which belongs to the Absarites. That night the Lord said to him, Take your father's bull and the second bull seven years old and pull down the altar of Baal that your father has, and cut down the Asherah that is beside it. And build an altar to the Lord your God on the top of the stronghold here, with stones laid in due order. Then take the second bull and offer it as a burnt offering with the wood of Asherah that you shall cut down. So the burnt offering with the second bull is done with the wood of Asherah that you cut down. God says to Gideon. In verse 27, So Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had told him, but because he was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day, he did it by night. Every man has a fear of those who are closest to the, that person. That they'll be criticized by them. Especially when they're called to do something radical. His family and the men of the town that were there would have said, Don't you do this? Are you stupid? We're slaves. They outnumber us. You're only going to cause trouble for us. You're only going to make the oppression worse. You know what? If you can't beat them, just join them. But that's not what Gideon did here. Gideon didn't adhere to that type of defeatism. Gideon was called to do something great and was called to fight to liberate his people. That idol of Asherah that he took down with Gideon, the ten men, of, uh, his, the ten men his servants took down that, that idol, 
they burn that wood in a, in a burnt offering. The second bull. We find that that Gideon is breaking down. The very first thing he does that God calls him to do is to break down the idols that the, the slave the enslaved minds of Israel serve. We're returning back to the real God now. That's what Gideon's saying with his action. He's saying, Your idols, we're breaking them down. We're destroying them. We're casting them down. They did not serve us. Now we're returning back to the mentality that says the Lord is God. We are committing to one God and to one Lord, Yehovah. But anytime someone does rad something radical, there is always great opposition. Verse 28, when the men of the town rose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was broken down. And Asherah beside it was cut down. And the second bull was offered on the altar that had been built. And they said to one another, <clears throat> Who has done this thing? And after they had searched and inquired, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, has done this thing. Then the men of the town said to Joash, his father, Bring out your son that he may die, for he has broken down the altar of Baal, and cut down the Asherah beside it. Joash was a very wise father. He knew that the Lord had chosen his son. He knew that the idols that were being held to by the oppressors and by the oppressed, by the Midianites and by the children of Israel, were worthless idols. It says, Joash said to all who stood against him, Will you contend for Baal? Or will you save him? Whoever contends for him shall be put to death by mourning. If he is a god, let him contend for himself, because his altar has been broken down. If he's a god, let him come build his own altar. If he's so powerful. Therefore on that day Gideon was called Jerubbabel, that is to say, let Baal contend against him, because he broke down his altar. This altar of a false god had enslaved the children of Israel, and Gideon had come to break it down. And that's what he did. Because he was about liberating Israel from false gods and from being oppressed by those false gods. Now all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east came together and they crossed the Jordan and encamped in the valley of Jezreel. But the Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon and he sounded the trumpet and the Abrazites were called out to follow him. And he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, and they too were called out to follow him. And he sent messengers to Asher and Zebulon and Naphtali, and they went up to meet him. So now the, the troops are getting in their places. The war is ready to take place. The troops are being recruited. The, the warriors are training. The battle is about to commence. And these people are being called to Gideon. These people who before may have been oppressed. These people who before may not have been willing to fight. Now we're beginning to see the way of peace and the way of God. And beginning to see the liberation in the true God. And setting aside their false idols. And being filled with courage. Now they've been recruited to Gideon. Then Gideon said to God, verse 36, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, behold, I am laying a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. 
if there is dew on the fleece alone, and it is dry on, the, on all the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And it was so, when he rose early next morning and squeezed the fleece, he wrung enough dew from the, the fleece to fill a bowl with water. So it had been dry all over, but it, it was wet just on this fleece that Gideon set up. Then Gideon said to God, Let not your anger burn against me. Let me speak just once more. Please let me test just once more with the fleece. Please let it be dry on the fleece only, and all the ground that there be dew. And God did so that night, and it was dry on the fleece only, and on all the ground there was dew. Now we would think that if Gideon had been spoken to by the angel of the Lord and that he had he had put a test to the angel of the Lord that we find in in chapter six with the meat and the unleavened cakes, that it would have already been confirmed in his mind that he was chosen. It may have already been confirmed in his mind that he might believe that he had the courage to continue. But such as man that he must be continually empowered by God to sustain his courage, to sustain his belief. One miracle is miraculous, is amazing. But men have a tendency to make what is a miracle into a cliché. When the radio first came out, it was amazing. I would doubt that I myself or anyone that you know here in America, when they turn on the radio in the car, they go, This is amazing! Radio waves? It's traveling through the air and I can't see it and the message is being sent? Invisibly? What type of dark magic is this that you've come up with? It was amazing in the beginning. Because it was new. It was just a miracle. But alas, over time it became cliche. Because men became used to it. And God knows that men are like that. He knows that we take what is a fad or amazing and make it into something monotonous. So... <clears throat> He tests, Gideon tests God here again with the fleece. The very first time, he says that the dew is on the, fle is on the fleece alone and is dry on all the ground, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand. And that was the case. There was dew on the fleece, and it was dry on all the ground. And the next time, it was dry just on the fleece and wet on all the ground. And so there again, God had confirmed to Gideon I will be with you. That's what he's saying to him with this miracle. Now we come to the battle. Chapter 7, verse 1. Then Jerubbabel, uh, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him, <clears throat> rose early and encamped beside the spring of Herod, Herod. And the camp of Midianite was north of them, by the hill of Moreh, in the valley. The Lord said to Gideon, The people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand. Lest Israel boast over me, saying, My own hand has saved me. <clears throat> now therefore proclaim the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home and hurry away from Mount Gilead. Then 22,000 of the people returned, and 10,000 remained. 